My name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Innovation Showcase. The main purpose of this ongoing series is to inform viewers about exciting innovations and creative individuals across the fields of business, science, technology, education, and the arts. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Robert Timofeychuk. Robert is an award-winning teacher and assistant principal at the New Murnam School in Alberta, Canada. In 2022, he was awarded the Prime Minister's Award for Teaching Excellence in STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. In addition to his noteworthy accomplishments as an educator, Robert is also an extremely inventive and highly accomplished maker, a self-described tinkerer. During the program, we're hearing about Robert's fascination with hovercrafts and how over the course of almost 2,000 hours, he recently built his own homemade hovercraft out of salvaged auto parts. Let's start by meeting Robert and then hearing all about, as well as seeing, his incredible homemade hovercraft. Welcome, Robert. So delighted you're able to be here. Oh, thank you, Jay. I'm just thrilled to be on the show. You know, and just have to start by saying congratulations on the undertaking, the incredible achievement, eager to hear about it, have you inform viewers. Before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest if you'd very briefly share anything else about your background, professional interests, teaching position, please. Yeah, um, so I, I grew up in a very small, uh, you know, rural farm setting, and uh, I was a farm kid. And uh, when you when you grow up a farm kid, you, you, it, it changes you. You know, it, it's a very hands hands on approach. Uh, we weren't um, you know kind of well off economically, and you know the, the farm you know back when I was a kid, it, it was it was just always a struggle. And uh, because of that process, uh, you know, you're you're a little bit of a mechanic, uh, you're a little bit of a, of a welder, you're a little bit of an electrician. Yeah. Um, you you had to be kind of maybe you know jack of all trades to to kind of get by with farming. And you know because uh, you know economics were were tight, uh, most of the stuff we fixed ourselves. And uh, you know I I grew up um, you know kind of as as a tinker. Uh, you know I love fixing things, and uh, you know got bitten by the science bug. Uh, from my my grade grade five uh, science teacher, and uh, life's never been the same since. So, uh, you know, I, I'm currently 55 years of age. Uh, you know, 35 years into teaching, and I, I'm I'm enjoying myself. Like I'm <laughs> really enjoying myself. Oh, and even though it's not the focus of today's program, I uh, definitely encourage viewers to look into your school and the success that you and others have had there with your project approach uh, to education. But that said, why and how did your fascination with hovercrafts come about? Well, um, you know, Jay, I, I don't know if you and I are the same vintage, but when, when we grew up, like when I was a kid, there was three television channels. And mm -hmm. this is the old, you know, kind of black and white TV. And then there was a little bit of color TV. And most, most of the time it was very snowy. But there was like channel two, channel four, and channel yeah. five. I think two and five were the same thing anyways. But <laughs> one, one day I saw uh, this hovercraft in, uh, next to a lake in the, in the late fall. And there was some ice that was formed along the, the shoreline of the lake. And a person got on board this hovercraft, uh, I think reached up behind him, uh, started up, it levitated. And it took off seamlessly right, right from the shore onto the, the, across this little bit of ice and onto the lake. And there was hardly a ripple. And at that point I was hooked and it, it, it was like, I had to have one of those things. Like it, it's, it's a crazy burning desire, but you know, number one, you know, the economics were tight and, and you don't go to the local power store, power sports dealer and say, you know, I'd like to buy a hovercraft, please. Like, you know, we're in a modern world now and things are different, but uh, it was, it was so intriguing. So mm -hmm. that, that was, uh, essentially the, the seed from, from where this all started. So how did you go about beginning designing it? Did you follow some blueprints? Well, the, the um, when I was in grade 11, um, you know, years and years ago, um, I ended up uh, ordering in plans. I, I think it was like from Popular Science. They have the little ads in the back of the book and it says, uh, you know, hovercraft plans, uh, you know, pay $2 and they'll send you a booklet. And there was a, a firm called Universal Hovercraft uh, loca located in uh, Cordova, Illinois. 
And they ended up sending me this little catalog and it had, you know, from very small crafts into very large crafts. And I selected one that I ordered plans for. And uh, I ended up building that. It was like a, like a five-year project. Wow. And um, there were things that I improvised on, you know, in order to uh, kind of make it more robust. And uh, I remember um, it was all painted and it was beautiful. And dad had taken uh, the front end loader and, and moved this out of the shop onto the lawn. Mom's there with a camera, you know, uh, taking pictures. And I revved up the engines and guess what? It didn't move. Oh. <laughs> five years, five years, Jay. Wow. And it, and it didn't move, but uh, oh. I, I was, it was too tail heavy and essentially uh, modified and modified and modified to, to lighten it up and uh, get back to the plan and say, okay, you know, you know, uh, change this, change that. And eventually I got it working and it, it, it worked reasonably well. And uh, that gave me uh, backgrounds about the do's and don'ts about hovercraft, especially in the fabrication part, like weight is everything and, and strength is, is, is critical. And then uh, that led to the second hovercraft, which is, uh, you know, the one that we're kind of talking about uh, today that, that kind of uh, was kind of popular lately in the media. Well, you learned, it sounds like at an early age, what uh, seasoned inventors know and that the value of the iterative approach, you know, trying something, even if it's over the course of five years before you get that final feedback, yes. but having the feedback, taking it and reapplying what you learned, having that persistence and then, um, getting the success, the final output, your desired, whatever the situation might be, and definitely served you well in this next uh, adventure. How did you go about getting the parts? Well, it's a very unique story. Uh, so so one day I uh, get a call from the mayor of Murnum. Uh, his name's uh, Ed Snowski. And he says, uh, Robert, he says, yeah, you built a hovercraft before? And I says, yeah. And he says, well, there, there was uh, two gentlemen that had set up shop in tiny little Murnum, Alberta. Like this is, uh, you know, like a community of 600 at, on, on the mm. very best. Um, anyways, they, they were uh, working on a, um, a prototype, I guess, for the military uh, of a hovercraft. And there were some uh, uh, parts that were in this kind of decrepit building, and they essentially the village wanted to take take over the lot because uh, the the gentleman had kind of stopped on on the project. And um, Ed says, you know, uh, we're going to take the like a loader and crush whatever's there and bring it into the landfill. <laughs> it's oh. like no, no, don't <laughs> do that. Like you know, like anything associated with the hovercraft, you do not want to do that. <laughs> So uh, my, my son was fairly young. He was in his teens and we, we uh, had our, uh, you know, I don't know, 12 foot tilt trailer that we brought to Murnum. And uh, lo and behold, there was uh, the, the mold for a hull and some bits and pieces. Uh -huh. And uh, that essentially was the, the basis to the craft. And uh, it, was, it was really weird because uh, the, the hull was, was there, but I wasn't willing to make a like another copy based on the mold because I had no idea if this thing would even work. And you could mm -hmm. end up spending three, four or five grand on fiberglass and a lot of work and then then find out that it doesn't work. So I ended up converting the mold into the craft. So I started off with a chainsaw and uh, an angle grinder, like lots and lots of terrible, nasty work uh, and essentially trying to um, make it smooth on top. And it was already smooth on the bottom because it was it was reverse of what it should have been, but started off you know with that, and then uh, you know uh, pieces kind of kind of came together, and this is like a burning desire in order to try to make this into something useful, and yeah. essentially uh, you know a, a cab off of a '97 Jeep Cherokee. Uh, an engine, a real peppy little engine out of a, a, a Toyota uh, Celica. Um, I, like knowledge of the internet, a bunch of like hundreds and hundreds of hours of research and yeah. then things start to roll together. And uh, I got so um, captivated by the project that essentially was done in the course of a year, roughly about 1800 hours and uh, my wife was tremendously supportive. She she uh, sewed all the skirt segments for it. Uh, it, it. It's like, it was a leap of faith because I had no idea if it was gonna even work, but I thought, you know, what's the worst case scenario? Like like the first project, you know, you work <laughs> five years and it doesn't go and maybe That's I worked for attitude. 1800 hours and it doesn't go. So, so I have a big paperweight, you know, in the yard, right? <laughs> well, you know, in addition to producing the hovercraft, you've also created a terrific, fabulous summary 
of the discussion you just started. So we want to take advantage of that and enjoy this video clip that's going to go for about 12 and a half minutes with you providing wonderful commentary. Feel free if you notice an area you want to add something to, but we want to jump right in and enjoy that now. Even as a child, I had a fascination about hovercrafts. Fascination may not be the correct term. Looking back on it, it was more of an obsession. In this video, I will show you how I built my craft. I acquired the hull from a village near my home. The hull was in an abandoned building and was destined for the landfill. Whoever started this seemed like they had the right shapes, so I felt the design should work. What I will show you is not based on a plan, just my intuition based on previous experiences. This project truly was a leap of faith as so much energy and time went into the build without knowing for certain if it would work. A friend had a 1985 Toyota Celica that had a good engine but a rusty body. The car had lots of spunk so it seemed like a good engine for the craft. The problem was that the car had the first fuel-injected 22R engine. There were nearly 30 pounds of wiring harness and I had to shed most of the weight. I had to get the engine started first and then prune back wiring and get rid of non-essential parts. It is July 25th and we got fuel flowing through the filter, coming to the tank okay. contact. and contact. <laughs> I needed flexible fiberglass panels to complete the hull, so I made my own sheets by waxing a steel plate and then laying fiberglass matting onto the steel sheet. The wax made it easy to peel away from the steel sheet. I had to close in the plenum where the air would get directed through holes that would feed each skirt segment. You will see the fiberglass runners I fabricated for the bottom of the craft by waxing a 2x2 two two board and covering it with fiberglass. With the bottom sheets in place, I was able to fiberglass over the structure to provide rigidity. I started work on the rudders. They were made with three wood airfoil shapes, then covered with clear plastic. I poured expandable foam, then sanded it to shape and fiberglassed them. The rod supporting them is from a fiberglass roadway marker, so it will not corrode or swell with humidity. What would be a hovercraft without a joystick? I wanted a joystick handle that custom fit my hand, so I used paper mache to get the shape right and then fiberglassed it. The hull bottom lacked rigidity, so I used my fiberglass panels to make box structures. I filled them with expandable foam and then seal the top with a fiberglass sheet. I had to order the fan as I needed to get the drivetrain working. I ordered the fan and belt from Universal Hovercraft. I needed a pulley for the belt. I couldn't find a lightweight pulley so I had to make one out of laminated plywood. I did some research on the belt profile. I then drafted the profile and cut it on my CNC plasma table to make a tool suitable for machining the grooves and the wooden pulley. The plywood had some knots in the layers, so I used resin to fill in the holes and then recut the grooves on the pulley. Pulleys seemed perfectly balanced. I was so happy. Even better yet, the belt fit perfectly. Now it was time to work on the drive system. I cut a quarter inch plate on the CNC and mounted a flexible coupler. 
A shaft connects the coupler to a pulley supported by a pillow block bearing assembly. I had to fiberglass the support for the engine mount and radiator. I fabricated a mount for the upper pulley that drives the fan. There are close tolerances between the fan and the, the duct. In this case, about an eighth of an inch maximum. I did not want any vibration that would cause fan contact with the duct, so I stiffened the mount assembly with cross braces. At the time, I did not have a belt tensioner, but later I added one. I mounted the rudders, and it was time for the first test. To be honest, I was quite scared that I'd have contact between the fan assembly and the shroud, and the whole thing would blow apart. January 5th, 2016. This is the first start of the engine with the fan. Starting up the fuel pump. Hopefully no leaks. Start to draw custom skirt segments based on the measurements of the hull. Fortunately, I found a document online of how to do this. There are seven different skirt profiles. My wife is amazing. She sewed the 107 individual segments that make up the entire skirt. The craft cannot be complete without a cab. We brought back a 1997 Jeep Cherokee from the local auto wreckers. The cab is amazing, but I needed to reduce its weight as much as possible. At this point, I wasn't sure how that cab was going to fit on the body. My neighbor Murray came over to help me figure that out, and we seemed to have a good fit. The craft needed a heater to keep the occupants warm, and also keep the windows from fogging. So I built a box around an old school bus auxiliary heater core and attached it to the window assembly. I began work on the dash to fit a GPS, tack, voltmeter, cool and temperature gauge, ignition switch, hour meter, and a ham radio, as well as a bank of switches. It was time to test the craft to see if it would lift now that the skirt segments are installed. skirt worked perfectly. I wanted to test the craft outside, but found out that there's a slight slope in front of the shop. Contact! Every hovercraft needs comfortable heated seats, so I found two seats from a Volkswagen Jetta. This is the final dashboard, complete with switches for the light bar, side and cargo LED lights, strobe, navigation lights, bilge pump, window washer, wipers and horn. It was time to paint starting with a primer coat. I love the color red. The last application was a clear coat 
that made the red come alive. I wanted to try the craft at the lake, but I had no way to haul the craft. So I found a gutted RV for $700 and made it into a flat deck with a loading platform. It was time to bring the craft to the lake. Notice that there are no guards in front of the fan. I was so eager to see if it worked, I couldn't wait. The craft worked really well. Top speed was about 58 kilometers per hour with three people on board. I added a screen assembly and closed in the cab rear with a sliding door assembly. Thanks for watching. If you like, please subscribe. It's working flawlessly. Yeah, it's it's surprising, Jay. It, it's um, you sometimes you you build things and they they don't quite work as anticipated. <laughs> this one did. Thanks for watching. If you like, please subscribe. We'll have your YouTube channel in the credits. You know, what was the most rewarding, a surprising technical aspect throughout that whole building process? Well, well, the most technical part was trying to uh, take this used engine and get it to turn a fan in this shroud, uh, like a duct, with uh, probably an eighth inch or less uh, clearance between the fan and, and the duct. Because if you have a really tight uh, tolerance, uh, it's an efficient system. And, you know, when you're spending that kind of time on things, you want things efficient. <laughs> so uh, that, that was definitely a, like a really uh, difficult thing to uh, to know of, of how to uh, convert that, that engine drive assembly, uh, you know, kind of across, keep the weight down and then bring it up and have everything uh, very stiff and, and robust. That, that was definitely the, the technical challenge part. In fact, uh, what had happened was the, uh, the hull uh, and the engine uh, sat in my yard for about seven years because I, I, I tried to get on the internet at the time and do a bunch of research, but at the time when I did it, they're, they're, uh, like every moment that goes by on the internet, there's more and more content. And mm -hmm. you can find, uh, you know, um, similar uh, projects or people that have some some idea how to do this. So when I did the original research, 
it wasn't evident of how to do it. So um, essentially, uh, you know, I had some ideas and it, it sat for the longest time and I, it really bothered me for it to be sitting around the yard. And, you know, yeah. my wife was very understanding, but <laughs> it was like, you know, like, Robert, what are you going to do with this thing? Right. <laughs> and uh, even that engine sat for uh, like, like for seven years. Wow. And it was, it's, it's hard to believe, but, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, to fire it up and it started just zipped. It, the, that was the video, the very first start of it. So we, we took an old uh, snowmobile tank, uh, had a fuel pump in there to de deliver fuel. Uh, I learned a lot about fuel injection and, and wiring. And there was, there was gobs of wiring on that thing. Like it was all these systems that were part of it. Like when you, you don't think of it that way, but the, the car is an entire system. And uh, I had to make it light enough and I had to make it, you know, compact enough and I remember the engine would be running and it'll, I'd try to take, uh, you know, whatever part there was attached to it and okay, unplug it. Oh, engine dies. No, can't do that. <laughs> okay. That's obviously critical. didn't know what that part was sometimes. And then the next one, they unplug it. No, no, no problems. Right. And then paired it down to the, to the basics and I had to package it into, um, you know, like an assembly. And it would have been like a heck of a lot easier to, to do it without the fuel injection part, but the fuel injection is so reliable. Uh, you know, it's, it, it takes care of choke, uh, you know, the air fuel mix, uh, turn the key and it, it's, it's completely predictable and reliable. The first hovercraft that I did, it was, you know, using lawnmower engines and uh, mm. boy, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, nothing like a reliability of, of an automobile engine. And, you know, and you have an, an alternator on there, uh, proper electrical system. There's a block heater if you want to use it in, in wintertime. Um, just, just a different robust craft. You know, in the two minutes we have left, time is going very fast. Is the, I know you're still and rightly so savoring this accomplishment, but in the back of your mind, is there anything um, you're excited to do next, a future project in mind yet? Well, you know, uh, Jay, the, the, um, uh, you probably saw on the YouTube channel, you know, there was the, you know, the sawmill and the solar tracker and uh, kind of goes on and on with the projects based on need. Uh, so, so right now I, I'm just starting to enjoy some of those projects too. Like uh, I only have about 30 hours on the craft and I, I do want to get out onto the river, uh, go with my wife fishing, uh, do some prospecting for gold along the river. And uh, there, there will be another project. I just don't know what that one's going to be. Yet. Yeah, no. Well, you rightly deserved a lot of time to enjoy your exploring um, and do recommend uh, viewers and others to go to both sites that we'll have uh, for additional information to see some of the projects you just mentioned, as well as getting back to the success of you and others at your school, um, the incredible work you do with students and the community, the interrelatedness of the subject matter of the real world, so impressive and I can see and maybe another time we'll hear from you how your tinkering and your makering enhances your teaching, because it definitely comes out in the type of projects that are done at the New Merman School. Um, but for today, Robert, thank you again so much for being here. It's been very inspiring to see your work. I'm definitely going to follow up with understanding some of your other uh, inventions and projects and uh, continued success with future endeavors. Well, thank you, Jay. It's, it's such a pleasure to, to share it. Like it's, it's one of those things that warms your heart. <laughs> it's wonderful. I also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.